worship team for just being available just to present your gifts to give to us. Amen? Amen? Oh, God is good. God is good. God is good. Come on. Come on. Let your praise just come out of you. Let your worship come out of you. We're not made to be statues. Amen. We're not made just to sit there like let the joy come out and seep out of you. Come on. Worship him. Worship him. He deserves all the praise. Amen. Amen. I'm pretty sure in heaven we're not going to sit there like, God, you are good. Like, come on. Give him, give him some praise. Amen. Oh, we are here. We're here. This is it. This is it. This is the end of what I think has been an amazing series, something that, that God has anointed, God has worked through. Okay, kids can go to kids' church. Thank you very much, Emma, for sitting there. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Otherwise, I'll just keep preaching. Thank you, children. Thank you, kids' church leaders. Woo! Oh, we're not done. We're not done. This is it. This is the last sermon. Well, maybe, unless God says, no, I'm not done which he did four weeks ago. We've been, we've been through some stuff in this series. And if you've, if you've been with us in the last eight weeks, then you've, you've heard some stuff. And even if you agree with it all, you know, and you've, you've made some changes and you've confronted your comfort and you've confronted your condemnation, you've confronted your convenience and you've confronted all that stuff, but there's still something there. There's still something deep there that's got you caught up in the wilderness, caught up in the desert, and maybe it's a deeper wound than they can get solved in one week. Maybe it's a deeper habit um, than can be solved in one week. Maybe you've got a hurt or an issue or a pain that has been plaguing you for years and years and years. And I, th- I want to say, I feel like today, let's be bold and let's confront it. Let's be bold and let's confront it. Because we've been pretty bold this whole series. Amen. So we are in a message series, if you have just joined us, called Treasured Possession. And we spoke about what treasure possession means. It means owned by the Lord. It means precious. It means owned. The, the Hebrew word is segula. Right? We spoke about choosing to break the patterns that are holding us from getting out of the wilderness, from getting out of the desert. And then we just got stuck there, really, and we just kept preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching. So we spoke about living, if you can't remember, we spoke about living comfortably uncomfortable. We spoke about a life for Christ is not meant to be comfortable. It's meant to be uncomfortable. We spoke about killing comparison in our lives. We're not meant to compare to each other. We're meant to compare to Christ only. And not to see how far away we are, but to see how close we're getting. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And then we smashed condemnation. We said there's no condemnation in Christ. Condemnation is a permanent sentence for your sin, which got the penalty was taken away by Jesus Christ. Amen? And we don't have that permanent sentence on our life anymore anymore, but we can still walk around in that cloud of condemnation. And then we spoke about winning the war within to move through the wilderness, and we spoke about um, the spirit against the flesh, and how we are meant to feed our spirit and deny our flesh. Feed our spirit, deny our flesh, right? And last week we spoke about opinions. We spoke about which opinions to take, which opinions not to take, didn't we? And everyone's like, oh, did we really speak about all that? I have to go back. That's key. But I, I do feel like it's been a very direct series. It has, for me, I feel like I've felt it all. Like I feel like I've got convicted every week, every month I've been writing these messages. I just feel like I've been poof, 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 smashed. It has been heavy. I think it's been confrontational. I think it's been encouraging. Um, but I'm sure if you've come here with an open heart, looking for change, I'm sure it's done something to you. My prayer is that it's done something to you, that it's stretched you, that it's changed you, that you, you, you want to actually change to be a more Christ-like character for God. That's, that's my prayer. That's my prayer. And, I, and I, you know, I, say, I say it every week, you know, but we shouldn't just come on a Sunday because we come on a Sunday. We should come expecting to hear from God, expecting to hear that God's got a message for his people. In, in Acts, it says that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching because the apostles' teaching has something for that community. Like God is speaking, and I want to encourage you to open his heart like he has a word for you. Conviction is good. It brings you closer to God. Conviction brings you closer to God. All right? And I, and I feel like, <laughs> I feel like today we, we're going to, I think we're going to smash it with the last one. I think this one's going to be, this one's going to be pretty heavy. I feel like it's going to be pretty heavy. What I want to do is I want to look at something that is, is deep. I want to look at something that is, might be something in your life 
that you haven't really confronted, that you've just tried to squish down. Don't we do that? Sometimes we just get something that happened to us years and years and years ago, and we just squish it down. I've done it, so me first, right? Me too. <laughs> me too, right? And we squish it down. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how we just go with the crowd. Sometimes what we do is we just drift towards the world, and we drift towards isolation, and all the things that we've been confronting in the last seven weeks is because of that. Condemnation, comfort, convenience, it's because we drift towards the masses. We drift towards what the crowd is doing. And I want to look at the lies that have kept us down, and I want to look at what we can do about it. Is that all right? That's a pretty big intro. <laughs> can we do that? Can we go there together? Yeah? Yeah? Amen? All right. So the title of today's message is How to Confront the Crowd and Bring Your Deepest Issue to God. How to Confront the Crowd and Bring Your Deepest Issue to God. Right? And my hope is that you'll understand that freedom starts with a choice to confront that which is holding you back. Freedom starts with a choice to confront that which is holding you back. Amen. So I'm going to pray because we need God's grace. Lord, I just pray and hope that you will give us your grace, Father. We, we, we live in unmeasurable favour. We live constantly in your grace, which is just a free gift from you, Father. We live in a, in a time, Lord, that was given to us by Jesus Christ, Father. We live in freedom and forgiveness because you sent your Son to die for us, Lord. And we want to hear from you now, Father. Lord, we want this to be all about you and, and not about me and not about notes and not about ego and not about arrogance, Father, but we just want to hear from you, Father. Father, we know that your truth sets us free. We know that grace saves, but we know that your truth sets us free and we just want your truth, Father. Help me, Lord, just to get rid of anything that's not of you, Father. Help us to open our hearts, Father. Help us not to have a hard heart. Help us not to close up when the Spirit's convicting us, but help us to open those floodgates, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't that always a tendency? Like when we, when we go something heavy, when we go something hard, when we go something that's really truthful, we tend to close our heart because we're so worried about what everyone else will think. I want to encourage you that this is the place, this is the community where we should have open hearts. This is the one time, maybe in connect groups and maybe one-on-one -on -one with each other, but this is a time where you should be surrounded by, by God's people and have full permission to actually open up all of you and be met with grace and be met with compassion. And it breaks my heart to think that sometimes we feel like this is the place where we have to close up the most because we have to act like the perfect Christian. You know what I mean? Like, Everyone knows what I mean because it looks in your faces. <laughs> All right, let's start. <laughs> it's going to be a good one. I'm excited. Are you guys excited? I'm pumped. I'm honestly, this, this is all from God. All right, 1 Peter 2 to 9. No, 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. We'll get there. But you are a chosen race. How good is that? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvellous light. I literally, I don't have to preach. I could just read the Bible all day. This stuff is good. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you. Remember, when, we, when it says I urge you, it's like I, I implore you, I urge you as sojourners, as people moving through this world and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. How good is this? This is how God sees his treasure possession. This is what Peter is talking about, the living stones. Peter's talking about us as God's living, living stones. Not people, now God's people. Once had no identity in heaven, now we have an identity in eternity. <laughs> Once rebellious against God, in sin, and while we were sinners, Jesus Christ came for us while we were sinners, while we were in rebellion, to give us what? To give us mercy. To give us mercy. Just, just put this scripture up on your wall or your mirror or whatever when you are having an issue with your identity because while you were sinners, in rebellion against God is when Jesus came, not when you had everything right. Not when you had everything right. You were once exiled. You were once away from God. You are now God's people. I mean, 
Just let that sink into your heart. Let that sink into your hearts. Because Jesus came to give us an example, to show us what the kingdom would look like and to give us grace. Salvation is a free gift, not through anything that you have done, not through anything that you can earn, not through anything you, can, you, don't, even, you don't deserve. There's nothing you could have done. Like salvation is a free, free gift. And yet some of us, some of us, <laughs> most of us, we're going to be real. If you're new here, we are real because the truth, what? Sets us free. Amen? The truth sets us free. Most of us still carry another identity, don't we? Deep inside. Right? Another hurt, another label that just will not disappear from us, that we carry around like a ball and chain. You know, like you've got those massive, like, you know, back in the day, it was before our time, right? <laughs> back in the day, you got this massive ball and chains. You got that massive ball, and you're carrying it around. And it's like you try and get away from it. It's like, no, this is who I am. But you've got this massive ball and chain that you're still carrying around. And I feel like sometimes, even though we read these scriptures, even though that we know that God is for us, even though we know God loves us, there's still this ball and chain that we are dragging around in our life. And, and, and it doesn't matter how far away you get, it's still there. The chain is still there. It's still connected to this thing that is deep inside that we just try and run from, we try and squish down, right? We just try and squish down. And some of us, instead of leaning into what God would want for us, still want to follow the crowd, still want to follow the people of this world because it's easier. We come on a Sunday, but it's easier to follow the crowd. It's easier to follow the masses. And sometimes we really think, is, and uh, let's be honest, sometimes... I'm going to go there. Sometimes we open the Bible and we really, is this really where the healing happens? Is this really where the healing happens? In God's presence, this is really where the healing happens because the world is getting healed out there and the crowd is doing something else and they all seem really happy. Come on, you know, whenever you see your friends at a party on Facebook, right? They look really happy. Why, God? Why can't I go get drunk with my friends? They look really, really happy. Sometimes I feel like that looks more fun. Sometimes we feel like that looks more fun. Sometimes we feel like maybe I should go with them. Maybe I should go with us, them. And some of us are so distracted by the world, so distracted by the crowd, that we can actually miss the transformational power of Jesus. We actually miss the transformational power of community. We actually miss the transformational power of his word because we're so caught up with doing everything else that we've actually missed the, the power that Jesus has for us, right? And, and I, want, I, want to speak, <laughs> I want to speak to somebody that may feel isolated, that may feel hurt, that may feel alone, that may be caught up with the crowd, but there is something deeper in you that needs healing. And it's between you and God because it's so deep you don't even want to tell anyone else about it. But it's plagued you for years. It's plagued you from getting close to God. It's plagued you from giving everything over. It's plagued you from giving yourself to a spiritual mentor because you just can't bring that thing up. You can't, you can't bring that issue up because you feel like if you just squish it long enough, it will just go away. It won't go away. And it's only between you and God. You and God. And I want to journey through a bit of Jesus' ministry and have a look at one story in particular, right? I want to, I want to journey through Jesus' ministry and have a look what happens when all the crowds were around him and, and, look, and I just want to journey with you, okay? Cool? Can we do that? All right? Crowd, I think crowds and people and the world are very, very complicated things, right? It's very, very complicated to discern, like we spoke about last week, our walls and gates. It's very complicated to discern which crowds to follow, right? If you've ever taken a child to a theme park, you'll know exactly what I mean, right? We took our children to, like, the Gold Coast, and we went to Movie World, and we went to... Um, sea World, all the worlds, right? We went to all the worlds, right? And on the way to the worlds, you know, when you go to the parking and there's all the cars everywhere, how angry do we get just at slow moving cars? Isn't that really strange? We get so angry at slow moving cars, you know? And I think it's really funny how brave we get in slow moving cars as well. You know, some things that we say while we're in a car behind another slow car or someone that doesn't indicate and crosses into your lane right? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Some of the things that we say in those moments, we would never say to them in person. But we feel like because we've got this massive steel thing around us that we are invincible and somehow they can't see us. Like, I mean, maybe this is a personal issue, but I have to remind myself all the time that I'm a pastor on the road. You know what I mean? 
because that person could walk into my congregation and they'll be like, oh, it's that person that, you know, when I cut off was very, you know, nice to me. No, I'm, I'm, I'm never like that, right? We're all broken, okay? <laughs> anyway, so we're trying to park and we're so angry at all the other cars and then we had to park so far away and by we, I mean me, because Emma is just like the grace of God and perfection, right? <laughs> and so I was like, are you serious? And then every car park you try and take, everyone thinks it's Rally 2000. They try and get in before you, right? And then we have to walk and then we have to wait for this ticket booth. Like, what? Just put more people on staff. Seriously. But anyway, so we have to wait to get these tickets. And Alexis is sitting there and she's like, oh, come on, Dad. I just want to go to the park. I'm like, I know you do. Move. My daughter wants to go to the park. I didn't do that, right? (laughs) So we're, we're, we're... We're hating on these crowds, right? And we get in there, and then, oh my gosh, I mean, we usually go on school holidays. I mean, not school holidays, because, you know, the lines to a, to a ride that's free. I mean, that's another sermon in itself, isn't it? <laughs> Jump on a ride just because it's free. Anyway, so we're sitting in the, in the line, and it's like, oh, come on. And then you have to go pay $72 for a burger for lunch, because you can't bring food in there, right? So we just hide it in the esky in the, in the stroller. No, I'm kidding. Hey? Yeah, 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 you know, right? So we're, we're hating these crowds. And then do you know what happens? Like, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's an announcement at about 2 o'clock. And it says, everyone get to the middle of the park because there is a parade that is happening. So everyone get to the middle of the park. And all of a sudden, the crowds that we hated, we suddenly love because we want to follow them because they're going to the middle of the park where something is happening, Right? And so now, we're not hating the crowd. Alexis is like, we have to go do what everyone else is doing. We have to go to the middle of the park, because that's what's going to happen. We have to go to the parade. And so we're running to the parade, and Alexis is like, this is awesome. Look at the superheroes. This is amazing. And she turns to me, and she's like, Dad, I want to be one of those people. And I'm like, no, you don't. You are who God made you to be. Amen? Amen? And this is what happens to us. We get caught up in the parade. We get caught up in the crowd. The very crowd you said you wouldn't follow, you follow to the parade. And the very thing that you didn't want to be, you say, I'm not happy with myself anymore. I want to be like that person. And so we put a mask on, like Batman or Superman, because we would rather be that fake person. And so what we do is we put a mask on to cover who we really are, because we feel like who we really are, the world would not love anymore. We feel like the, world, the, the, the person who we really are, the world will not love anymore because the crowd is connected to that person. And I want to be more like that person than the way God made me to be. Amen? Amen? And so we put a mask on to mask the pain. We put a mask on to mask that identity. We put a mask on to mask that issue. And I think sometimes we get so caught up with our mask on that we've forgotten about the revelation of who God is. And we forget who God calls us to be. You know, crowds are complicated. People are complicated. Who to follow is complicated, isn't it? It's really complicated, right? And just because, first point, right? Just because there is volume or a mass of people does not mean that that's where the victory is. Amen? Just because there is volume or a mass of people does not mean that that is where the victory is. Just because everyone is going somewhere doesn't mean that that's where the victory is. The world says that the loudest voice wins. We have been conditioned to see volume as success, haven't we? We've been conditioned to see if that person sings a song and gets 10 million views on YouTube, they must be successful because of their volume. So if there's heaps of people following something, we must follow that thing because it must be successful because heaps of people are following it. But Jesus came and everyone hated him. <laughs> like ev- He had massive crowds following him until he turned around and said, all right, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then what happened? They all left, except 12. They all left. And he, he chose 12 people to change the entire world world. If you ever think that you don't have value, think about that. Amen? The same crowd that was trying to kill Jesus was the same crowd that he came to heal. Like, that is just crazy. That's crazy. Hear this, Matthew 4.23. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. 
The word kingdom, I want you to understand this. This is going to be really important to see to what we talk about, right? The word kingdom, the second half of the word, comes from dominion, right? Remember the Garden of Eden. What did God give us? Dominion, right? It's dominion, domain, dominion. The first part of that word is king. So what does that mean? It's king's dominion, right? King's domain. He came preaching of the gospel and the kingdom and the king's domain, right? And when Jesus taught us to pray, what did he say? He said, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your... You're going to have to, you're going to have to, like, if you're new here, you have to participate. This is not a one-way conversation, all right? Hallowed be your, your kingdom, your will be on earth as it is, on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Kingdom here has two meanings, eternity, but also, what do we sing? We sing the line, don't we? You brought heaven down to earth. You brought heaven down to earth. Christ came for forgiveness and freedom, but also to drop something off. He came to drop off the Holy Spirit. And then we, we sit there and Jesus said, your kingdom come to earth. Every time that you forgive someone that you can't do in your flesh, people get a glimpse of heaven. Like you are walking around with the light in you to present to the world as a glimpse of heaven heaven. Every time that there is a miracle, people see a glimpse of heaven. Every time there's a healing, people see a glimpse of heaven. Every time you love the way God calls us to love, people see a glimpse of heaven. A kingdom mentality is that we walk around bringing the light to the world so they can see and have a little taste of, of eternity. Jesus came as an example of the kingdom, amen, of eternity. Eternity is not something that we, eternity is something that we go to, but heaven and kingdom living is something you can have right now. It's something you can have right now when you deny your flesh and you feed your spirit and you operate out of the spirit. We are already saved, already loved, already forgiven, and still not yet. Still, we have sin inside us. Still, we are broken. Still, we're going to stumble. Still, we're going to fall. Gosh, I stumble every week. I stumble every week. But, but eternity, eternity, kingdom living, is when we look at our brother and we look at our sister in Christ and we give them the same grace that God gives us. And we give them the same truth that the Bible tells us to give them. Amen. 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 Heaven can be opened up to you as a God fearing believer as a glimpse of the kingdom right here and right now. As a glimpse of the kingdom. Amen. Every time, every time you do something that only the Holy Spirit can do. Where did the Spirit come from? Where did Jesus come from? He came from eternity. He came from heaven. Amen. Amen. When we say be the light, what do you think that means? Be a good person, that's why. You can be a good person without the Holy Spirit in you and you're still not the light. Because the light is pure, the Holy Spirit is sinless. The Holy Spirit is pure. And when we lean on Him, our flesh will deceive us. Our flesh will let us down. But when we, when we, when we rely on the Holy Spirit, something happens. People get a glimpse. And people say, where did that come from? And you've got no other answer but Christ. But Christ. So Jesus is preaching, right? He's travelling around. He's doing his ministry. He gets to this place where Jairus, a synagogue leader, pleads to save his little girl, right? A great crowd comes around Jesus, doesn't it? It says the word, it says a great crowd. And we meet the woman with the issue of blood. We meet the woman with the issue of blood. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. And implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged around him. He's about to do a healing. Let's get around him. He's about to do the good stuff. We love grace. We find it really difficult to accept truth. Right? And I want to, I want to preach from this. Sorry. Sometimes truth bombs just come out. I feel like someone needed to hear that. Okay. So I want to preach from this premise from now on, right? From this, this, this premise. Between your crisis, right? Between your crisis 
And your creator is your crowd, is your issue, is your hurt, is something that you have to face. Between where you are and who God wants you to be is your issue, is your crowd, is something that is plaguing you that you have to face. This lady with the blood was isolated, right? She was isolated, bleeding for 12 years. 12 years without family, without friends, because back then, if you were unclean, you couldn't be touched, you couldn't be seen in society, you had to be alone, right? And so I was like, oh, she's in crisis. And I'm like, what does crisis actually mean? You know, what does being in crisis actually mean? And, and so I looked it up and I said, hey, Siri, what does crisis actually mean, right? And Siri told me. Siri said, oh, Siri came up. All right. <laughs> crisis, three meanings, right? A time of, of intense difficulty or danger, right? A time when a difficult or important decision must be made. You're in a crisis, you have to make a decision. Listen to this. See if this resonates with you. The turning point of a disease when an important change takes place, indicating either recovery or death. A turning point in a disease indicating either recovery or death. When we're in a crisis, when we feel like we are in crisis, we have a choice to make. And we can either turn one way or we can turn the other. Isn't this what Jesus said? Whoever finds me finds life. Whoever denies me finds death. Amen? Amen? We were in crisis when Jesus came. We were in crisis. And Jesus is saying, whoever finds me finds life, whoever doesn't finds death. Right? Isaiah 118 to 20. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. When you're in crisis... God wants you to take it to him. He wants you to take it to him. Let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. I will take them away. That's what God's saying. If you are. (laughs) Come on! Why do you have to give us conditions all the time? The law is Old Testament. I don't have to do anything. I have grace. Why do you have to put conditions on this? Come on, I just want the easy stuff. If you are willing and obedient, if you want to, and if you want to obey, you shall eat the good of the land. This is why we preach truth in this church, because truth will set you free. We want people to eat the good of the land, amen. We want people to walk in freedom, amen. And we want people to walk in the light, We don't want whitewashed tombs because we know that Jesus said they are whitewashed tombs because they look great on the outside and yet you're turmoiling on the inside. You're turmoiling on the inside. We can go to a service and be like, oh, that that was so good. And then we get in our car and we cry and we don't know why. We don't know why because everything in there sounded great, but it didn't get to what Jesus wants us to get to. And that is real change in our lives. God wants us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. By the way, not because the law tells you to, not because the law says you must do it, but because you shall eat the good of the land. Amen. Amen. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's a really clear instruction of how to find life. Amen. Amen. And do you know what? To get there, it's going to be messy and it's going to be rough and you're going to have to take some stuff, you have to give some stuff, and that's okay. Mark 5.25. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Look at how she is labelled. Look at how her identity is given to her. Right? Her identity is given to her right now by her issue. Her identity is given to her by her issue. She's not identified as, as a name, She's identified by the woman with the issue of blood. With the woman of the discharge of blood. Right? And we all have issues. Amen? We all have issues. If you have an issue, put your hand up. Amen. Amen. If you're not putting your hand up right now, that could be your issue. Right? <laughs> this, woman, this, this woman has an issue of blood. And we are, we are certain, we are certain that the Bible tells us that she is 
bleeding, right? But we are uncertain of the cause. Amen? Follow me here. We are certain of her issue, which is blood, but we are uncertain of her identity. We are certain of her pain, but we are uncertain of her purpose. We are certain that she has heard of Jesus, but we are uncertain that she can get to Jesus. And sometimes, sometimes we can be certain that everything is not right about us, everything is not right about me, but we can be uncertain if we actually want to do anything about it. <laughs> right? Anyone been certainly uncertain? I think we live in a state of certainly uncertain. We are certain that we want community. Come on. <laughs> Come on. We are certain that we want people around us. We are certain that we want people to encourage us. I mean, if I have a conversation with anyone and I said, if I could give you 10 perfect people that want to encourage you, that want to spur you on, that want to, want to get around you, you would say yes. And the problem is they don't exist because we're broken and that's why you need to give grace to each other. Amen. But we are certain that we want community, but we are uncertain if we should get plugged in. We are, we are certain we are certain that we want to hear truth, but we are uncertain that we can actually take it. Amen. We are certain that we want freedom, but we are uncertain about the way to get there. Right? And sometimes we can be so sick and tired. We can be so sick and tired of being sick and tired. Amen. We can be so sick and tired of being sick and tired, I think. And we can be so sick and tired to do anything about it. <laughs> sometimes we can be so sick and tired to do anything about it. And I want to tell you that the deficit... To, to your fixing, the deficit to this issue, the deficit is never with God. God never looks down on one of his children and says, I don't want you to have community. God never looks down on one of his children and says, I don't want you to have freedom. God never looks down on him and says, I don't want you to find the truth of God. God does not do that. The deficit is never with God. I am certain that God can change your situation, but uncertain sometimes that we believe it. I am certain that there is truth in the word of God that will change our lives, but uncertain that sometimes we just don't want to hear it. Sometimes we want to turn somewhere else. Sometimes it's too confronting. Sometimes it's too hard. Sometimes it's too harsh. Sometimes it's just rubbing too much. But I'm so certain that God wants to change your life. God wants to change our lives. God wants to change this community. God wants to change this church. God wants to change this region. I am certain that God loved the world so much that he sent his only son to die so that we could have eternal life. I am certain that God doesn't want to just change his community. God wants to change the entire world because the word of God tells us that his will is that no one shall perish. I am certain that God has good plans for God's people. Amen. Amen. Someone give God some praise because <laughs> God is good. God is good. And Jesus Christ will come back for his saints. I am certain. I am not certain when it's going to happen. I am not certain at the time or the hour because no one knows. But I am certain that the trumpets will sound and I am certain that we will get lifted up with God's people, with Jesus Christ and go to eternity to live with him forever. Amen. Amen. Come on. Someone give God some praise. That's the end goal. That's where we're going. And I'm certain that God has a purpose for every single person sitting in this room. But I am uncertain if we really want to step into it. And I am urging you, I am begging you to step into the purpose that God has for your life. I am urging you to seek first the kingdom because all else will be given to you because we're only here for a short time and you have a job to do in that short time. Do you know what all else will be given to you means? Do you know what it really means? If you want the truth, if you want the truth, it doesn't mean comfort. It doesn't mean riches. It means eternity without pain. Amen. Amen. Whatever you're going through, whatever pain you're going through, whatever suffering you're going through, counter all joy. Because it's for a short time. And I promise you that your trial will be a testimony for someone else. Amen. 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 12 years she was isolated. 
Think about this. 12 years she had an issue. 12 years of hurt. 12 years of plagued. I'm sure she had a mother. I'm sure she had a father. I'm sure she had a friend. 12 years of society telling her that you cannot be touched. 12 years without a hug. <laughs> like we, we, we glimpse over this stuff. We glimpse over this stuff in the Bible. 12 years without someone being face to face with her to tell her that someone loves her. 12 years. Because religion thought it was a good idea to set boundaries. Religion thought it was a good idea to set lines to keep people from coming in. Religion thought it was a really good idea to say, hey, stay there, you're sick, you can't come in. And Jesus came to cross those lines, amen? Jesus came to cross those lines. You need to understand that there is Jewish law and there is God's law, and they're two different things. They're two different things. It wasn't God's law that she couldn't have society and she couldn't have community. That was Jewish law. That was traditional law to say, stay away because you're not good enough. And we buy the lie today to say, stay away because you're not good enough. And there's always a slither of truth, isn't there? Because you're not. But God is. And God wants you to have community. (laughs) The only thing that would change this woman's deprivation is her desperation. I know they're big words, right? So I'll say it again. The only thing that would change this woman's deprivation, her loneliness, her emptiness, her nothingness, is her desperation. Church, there's a, there, there is a message here that we need to get desperate for God. We need to get desperate for Jesus. We need to put him first in everything that we do. When your principles are clear, your decisions are easy. Following the Bible is simple, but it's not easy. When your principles are clear, when you commit right now that I'm putting God first in these areas, right, your decisions are easy. When you commit to love people for people. Your decisions are easy. When you commit to say that you're going to be a good husband, your decisions are easy. A good wife, your decisions are easy. When you say, I'm going to stick with a person for the rest of my life, your decisions are easy. Not simple. Amen. I'm kidding. I love you. (laughs) It's very simple for us, all right? (laughs) But not... (laughs) Sometimes it's easy, all right? But when you, when you get into a, a marriage and you say, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in this marriage, not easy, but your decisions are simple because you've committed on the mountaintop. Don't commit in the valley. Commit on the mountaintop. Commit now. I'm going to put God first, no matter what. No matter what. I'm going to put the gathering of the people first because on Sunday, I feel like God's got a message for me. And when I'm going to invite somewhere else on a Sunday, I can't go because I've committed to God. When I, when I get invited somewhere else during the week, I've got a connect group. I'm committed to God. That's why I'm, I'm putting God first. I'm sorry. I'm putting God first. When you wake up in the morning and, and, you, and you're 30 minutes late and you're running around for work and you've committed to reading the Bible in the morning, you read the Bible in the morning. No, I'm committing to God. I'm committing to God. I'm committing. I'm committing. I'm making the commitment, right? We need to get desperate for God, desperate for change. Like We need to get desperate in this time. She was considered unclean. 12 years, it says... And who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and yet was no better but rather grew worse. She was bleeding. She was bleeding. And some of us are bleeding and we try and fix the bleeding and we don't look at the cause. We just try and medicate the bleeding and we have a deep issue inside of us. And, and, and we just, we bleed over everyone. It's not a very good picture, is it? Sorry about that. But some of us have this, this issue and this cause and you, you might go to a new area, you might get into a new relationship, you might, you might do something new, but the bleeding's still there because you haven't addressed the cause. And so you're just hurting everyone else around you because you won't address the cause. She had 
bleeding. Right? When I used to play, I played soccer. I played soccer and I, I rolled my ankle like, I don't know, like four weeks into the season or something. I rolled my ankle and I remember the coach you know, back in those days, just take painkillers. Just take painkillers, you'll be fine. Every time I ran around on a Thursday, you know, it hurt. Just take painkillers. Just take painkillers. Anyway, towards the end of the season, I went to a doctor. <laughs> like, <laughs> stop taking painkillers so I can see what's going on. Stop taking painkillers so I can see what's going on. Right? Because we, we medicate. We take painkillers. But painkillers, I, I, I honestly thought for such a long time that painkillers solved the issue. It doesn't solve the issue. Like, you don't have a headache that can be solved by Panadol. By Panadol. You have a headache because you're not sleeping well and you need to get more sleep, right? Or drink more water. That's the cause. But for so long, I thought Panadol and, and painkillers solved the issue, but they just mask the pain. They mask the pain. They mask the pain. And some of us are using painkillers for our problems. Alcohol, painkiller. <laughs> Playing games with people, painkiller. The job, that you want to be so good at and build a career, painkiller. The thing that you want to be labelled, painkiller. That, 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 that thing that you need validation for, painkiller. The identity that you want everyone to know you by, painkiller. And sometimes we cover something up that God doesn't want us to cover up anymore. God does not want us to cover up anymore. He wants you to bring it to Him. He wants you to bring it to him. You know, during COVID, and they, they, they shut down. <laughs> Isn't it interesting, you know, like, lives were so important during COVID. Everyone had to isolate. I won't say too much of my opinions while we're alive. Um, everyone had to isolate, right? But sport in the US could go on, you know? When they, uh, because healthy living doesn't solve COVID, but NBA might, right? <laughs> what they did was they made a bubble of uh, a couple of stadiums in the US, and they played the NBA games in the bubble, right? And they played a couple of games. And do you know what? This is a true story. Look it up, right? The player said, we can't play without the crowd. The player said, we actually need atmosphere. So you know what they did? They put a digital crowd in the NBA. They put a fake crowd in the NBA. And then through the speakers of the stadiums, they put cheering. They put cheering. So they put cardboard cutouts in the NBA game and they put cheering for the home team every time they scored. And you know, if you've ever been to an NBA game, they're like, defense. De they put this through the speaker as if people in the crowd was yelling this, but they were just cardboard cutouts. They needed the crowd to play. They needed the crowd to play. Sometimes we need the crowd to play, right? Digital, du <laughs> God tested me on that far out. Digital duplication, they called it, right? And you know what they did in stadiums? It was even worse. They got 10 people to sit around stadiums in the US, right? And they would scan this person and then they would duplicate this person digitally around the whole stadium and fill the stadium. So they were actually real people, but they were fake real people and they would duplicate them around the whole stadium and look like that, that, they're there. But they weren't actually there. That is insane. Is that not insane? I heard it solved zero COVID cases. Anyway, right? <laughs> and this is what happens with our past hurts, right? Sometimes, sometimes it's in our heads. Sometimes it's up here, right? Sometimes we have this fake crowd in our head that got planted there years ago that we can't get rid of, right? I remember... <laughs> I was going to be transparent, right? Because that's what we are, right? Amen? Transparent. People are like, can you believe you said that? Yeah, I said that. I'm the pastor and I'm being transparent because that's how we change. Amen? We're hot. I'm hot. No, I'm kidding. Humble, open and transparent. So church, if you don't want to be that, I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave and find a church where you just fill the pews. Um, okay, so <laughs> there, was a, there was a grand final, right? And um, for soccer and like, this was like, um, like a, it was a big game. It was a grand final, right? Anyway, and I had called in sick for a training. My mummy called me in sick, okay? Right? Mum, if you're watching this, you know the story's true, right? No, I'm kidding. Still love you. Um, <laughs> I've let it go. Um, so, there was a boy named Callum, right? I was the number one goalkeeper, and he was the number two goalkeeper, right? And I was goalkeeper the whole way through the season. Anyway, the coach filled the card out, and he got named number one goalkeeper for the grand final, Right? And the coach is like, I'm sorry, I've already filled the card out. You're number two for today, right? Grand final, are you kidding me? I mean, I've let it go, as you can tell, right? But I was, uh, I was a keeper all year, 
right? And then I get dropped for the final game, for the grand final. And this kid, Callum, who I've let go of and I've forgiven, right, came up to me and he said to me, I remember I was in the car and he said, you'll always be number two. You will never be good enough. And then he shook his shorts in my face that had the number one on it. And he's like, enjoy the bench, buddy. As you can tell, I've let it go. (laughs) But for so long, I had him in my head. You're a failure. You'll always be a number two. I don't know why that this moment stuck with me. I don't know why. I don't know why, but his voice was in my head. Honestly, like 10 years, this guy's voice was in my head. You're a number two. You're a failure. And so it drove me to achieve. And it drove me to be just intense with getting better and making sure I wasn't the number two. Making sure that I was a number one all the time. Because this kid's voice occupied a place in my head for so... I don't know how the world deals with it without Christ. I honestly don't. Because the world just gives them their identity, right? And they just take it and run with it. But for so long... I was like, I have to achieve, I have to achieve. And, and, and this is what happens. Can we go to the next slide, Lucy? Right? This guy, Callum, right? Who I've let go of. Please come to Christ. If you do, I'm sorry. Uh, right? He's sitting there hanging out in my brain all the time, telling me, right, that I'm not good enough. Maybe we have parents that split when we were young. And so something that God ordained to be beautiful in marriage, something that God ordained to be one flesh is suddenly just broken up. Go to the next one. And, and, and this person lives rent-free in our head, right? Because we, now we, just, we, we burn everyone that we meet because we don't believe that we can be happy because our parents weren't happy and that divorce just sits in there, right? And then what happens is over life, go to the next one, Lucy, we accumulate, accumulate all these voices in our head from things that have happened to us and these people occupy our head but they're not really there. It could be something that happened 30 years ago. That person might be dead and gone. And yet they're still occupying a place in our head. They're still yelling at us and giving us our identity. And some of us, some of us, we can be at home by ourselves and be yelled at by a fake crowd that's in our head. It's like there's so much going on in here and we just want it to go away. It's like we just want it to go away. Some of us are not actually extroverts, but we just want to hear the voice of the crowd that we're actually around rather than the voice of the crowd in our head. Some of us don't want to be at home alone because it just screams in us. And if there's anyone else, me too, right? Me too. Some of us carry around something that people have said our entire life, and God doesn't want you to live like this. God actually wants to break you free from this, right? But if we push the crowd down our head, if we push the issue down, right? If we push the hurt down, we we stay in crisis. We stay there and we never get to how our creator wants us to live. We never get to the way the creator wants us to live. And God wants us to actually bring this to the light. God actually wants us to bring this to the light. Like if you're having troubles, God wants you to bring it to the light. This is the place to bring it. If you've got an addiction, this is the place to bring it. If you've got issues, this is the place to bring it. God actually wants to bring it into the light. The enemy can't use something against you that you've brought to the light. Amen? He can't. It's like, yeah, I did that, and I'm talking about it. We're healed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. If we're healed by that, then we better start talking about it. Amen? If we're healed by the word of our testimony, we better start talking about it. Right? We better bring it to people. We better say, let's work on this thing. And I talked about it a few weeks ago that we're so afraid to bring things to spiritual authority because we feel like we're going to get punished for it instead of disciplined for it. But discipline is actually just moving towards who God wants you to be. But if you're going to do that, you need to bring the issue up and give it over to someone else and say, let's work on this together. It's like people work on their stuff, you know, I don't, I don't know if you, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to go there, right? People work on their stuff and people, people will say, oh, how's that, how's that person going that's working on their stuff? They're doing great because they're working on their stuff. 
Amen? It's like, it's like oh, I haven't, I haven't needed to speak to a pastor for 22 years and now everything is strong and this is great. Okay, that doesn't show you how good you are. That shows you how much you're covering up because we actually need each other to work through our stuff. That's why God put us together in community because we're broken and we need each other's help, right? We need each other's help and we need each other's help. The enemy says that if you bring it to the light, you are a failure. God says, if you bring it to the light, you are free. You are free if you bring it to the light. And who the sun sets free is free indeed, amen? Amen? This woman was done. This woman was done with her issue. I know it's been a little while, but I'm going to keep going. Is that okay? This woman was done with her issue. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Don't miss this part of the story. She had to leave her isolation, she had to leave her issue, and she had to push through that which was keeping her in isolation to get to Jesus. Twelve years, she was not allowed to be in society. This did not change because Jesus was there. She had to push through the crowd who kept her in isolation to get to Jesus. She had to face her issue. She had to face her issue. She had to face the label. She had to face her isolation. She had to face the crowd that hated her to get to Jesus. We have an issue that God is telling you, you need to face. You need to face it, right? She tried to get everything else to fix it. It didn't work. It didn't work. She needed one touch from Jesus. She needed to get to Jesus, no matter what. These people, they've kept me in isolation. These people that say, if I think about it, she had to touch the crowd. If she touched the crowd, they become unclean. If she touched the crowd, that is a death penalty for her. That's the law. That was the law. She had to, to, she had to push through that to get to Jesus. Complete desperation. Com- she confronted it. Imagine the fear. But Jesus is bigger than our fear. Amen. Amen. We've got to get to Jesus. God wants to be our number one. We've got to get to Jesus, church. Deuteronomy, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And there's a second like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Second like the first. That is incredible. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all you acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Amen. Matthew 10. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. She knew that the only way was Jesus, the only way out is Jesus. And remember what we said way back in the first sermon of this series. Deliverance starts with a decision. You can come up and get laid hands on you all you like, but if you have not decided that you actually want to be delivered from that thing you want to be delivered from, God can't deliver you from it. That was a tongue twister. You need to decide that you actually want to be delivered from it. Right? It starts with wanting to press into the issue. And I I just want to make a side note here that this does not mean that psychology is bad. This does not mean counselling is bad. This does not mean medication is bad. This does not mean talking to someone else is bad. What it means is squishing the issue down will lead to death. And I, I encourage you that if you seek those things out, make sure they're working from a Christian framework. Because how can someone tell you how God's creation is to be healed without understanding that there is a creator. (laughs) Amen? Amen? Seek those things out. Go speak to someone. It's not the dealing with it with other people that's the issue. It's squishing it down that's the issue. When we're in Queensland, right, quick story and then we'll finish up. I say that and then it'll be another half an hour. No, I'm kidding. Right, quick story. Nate in Queensland was running around this (laughs) glass coffee table, right, and chasing Alexis, is that right? You know, and he's running around this glass coffee table. Yeah, you all know where this is going. You've all had kids, right? Bam! Into the side of the coffee table. Not the side, the corner right there. 
nearly lost his eye and there's blood gushing out and I go to the hospital. Man, I was, I, Emma's like, do you want me to go in? I was like, I've got this, right? Couldn't remember his birthday. I was an absolute mess, right? Anyway, she's like, I get in there. I'm like, what do I do? And she's like, you have to apply pressure. You have to apply pressure to the womb, to the wound. Womb? Wounds, right? You have to apply pressure to the bleeding. If you are bleeding, if you are hurting, you have to apply pressure. That was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. He fell asleep, and I'm like, quick, put the stitches in, you know? And he's like, the doctor's like, no, we can't, because if he wakes up and jerks his head, he'll lose an eye. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So what do we do? He's like, we wake him up. I was like, you evil person. And I said, what do you want me to do? I'm going out the back. He's like, no, I need you to hold him down. I was like, don't you have nurses for that? You know? So anyway, I had to hold his head while they pierced his wound. Twice. Two stitches. In his eye. He was, how old was he? One? Two? Two? Two years old. And I'm holding his head. And he's screaming. Screaming. And this needle went through his eye. They cut it. And I hugged him. And suddenly the crying stopped. And he was healed. But there had to be pressure and pain and someone else to help to fix that wound. And it's the same today. This lady had to go through the crowd to get to Jesus. We have to go through a bit of pressure. So she touches Jesus and what happens? We know the end of the story, don't we? Immediately. The flow of blood dried up. Immediately. God is a God of immediately. <laughs> immediately. The flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. She was healed because she pushed through the issue and she got to Jesus. I'm not going to read the whole thing. She was healed. She was healed. And when you bring what is hurting, when you face what is pressure, when you lean into the things of God, you are met with grace and love. The story says that she fell down trembling in fear. Isn't that, isn't that oh my gosh, this is way too relevant for someone, right? Isn't this so true? We, we think we're going to be like met with so much anger and so much pain and so much judgment and yet the truth is that we're met with grace and love. That's the truth, right? Someone's getting free today. I feel it. I'm going to prophesy. <laughs> For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments with every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's a whole sermon. <laughs> Take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. A stronghold, a stronghold are lies, misconceptions, and deceptions that the enemy plants in the mind of believers that demean the nature and character of God. Amen. What strongholds do is it tells you that you deserve what you went through. And you now have to pay for what you went through for the rest of your life. That's what a stronghold does. That's what a stronghold does. We are breaking down these strongholds, but we can only do it together. And God has said to build a community of believers that truly love one another. That truly love one another. That's what we're building here. If you're new, welcome. You're invited. You are invited into this community. Uh, that's why we value character and commitment over competency. Because character and commitment is way more important than anything that you can actually do, right? Because it's about the heart. It's about building relationships. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. And as we come together, let us build each other up. Let us build each other up. Let us press into these issues. Let us be free because we know that grace saves, but truth will set us free. We, who are strong, have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. We have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. 
<laughs> Let each of us please his neighbour for his good to build him up. To build him up. I'm going to finish with a quick illustration because I want to really, I'm going to drive this home. Is that okay? I'm going to drive this home. Right? This. If you've ever seen YouTube, you will know that I'm quite handy with a couple of bricks and a couple of tools. And I might be known as the YouTube sensation of DIY Dad. It's true. And fans have been asking me for more episodes. They're coming, you know. So if you're a dad and you need some DIY help, it's coming. All right? We're transparent. <laughs> I built this myself. I know some of you are proud. Thank you, Larry. Woo! Right? This, right, I feel is how the world thinks Christians should be. Right? When we say build each other up, this is what I feel like the world thinks that Christians should be perfectly straight. This is a perfect Christian. It's perfectly square. I can build on a perfect foundation of myself and other people, right? And, and what, what's really painful, what's really hurtful is sometimes people in the church feel like this is how, how we should look. We should look perfect. We should build on perfection. We should have straight edges, right? And if you don't fit this mould, get out. Because we want people that look good, perform well. We want, we want smoke machines. They're coming, right? We want polished everything. Sam, in 35 minutes. It's a personal problem, right? Perfect kids. If you don't have perfect kids, get out. You know, because it depends wholly on you. Perfect marriages, perfect discipleship, all things that we should strive for, but we feel like we need to show the world that if you come to church, you'll be made perfect. Right? And the truth is that the only one that is perfect, you know where I'm going with this? Right? Is Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why Jesus Christ is the one ah, this might end badly, that makes up our foundation. Amen? Amen? And that's why the Bible tells us, oh, I just cut myself. It's a bit sharp. Sometimes the stones are a bit sharp. Sometimes we actually have sharp edges to us. And that's why the Bible doesn't call us living perfect slabs. It calls us living stones. Because stones are not perfect. Stones have edges. Stones are broken. Right? And the living stones are meant to be built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And we are meant to build each other up. Right? Because we are God's church. We are Us are God's church, Ecclesiastes, the calls out ones. We exist for the world. We are the ones with the light in us. But God did not intend us to be alone. God intended us to be built up, right? And every single one of us have different hurts and different brokenness and different pain, right? And different things that the world has done to us. But we are meant to build each other up. Do you reckon I can go another one? I reckon. Right? And yeah, it's a little unstable, and it looks a little bit messy. And you're going to go through things with people as you do community and as you do life with each other. I knew that was going to happen. I could use that as part of my analogy. That might happen. That might happen, though. We might be building each other up and we might make a mistake. God knows I have. And we might make a mistake, right? I'm going to use it. Because the world will come over here and say, you're not good enough. Get out of our church. Because you make us look bad. But God actually calls us When we stumble to get around this stone that's living, that has the Holy Spirit in us, and pick the stone back up and put the stone back on the wall as we build each other up as God's church. Amen. Amen. And the lie is that as you see the holes, that we're unstable because there's holes in the wall. There's holes in what's being built up. But do you know what shines through these holes? Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Because God is who builds his church. Amen. We do not. The Spirit 
is what brings goodness to our church. The Spirit is what brings healing to our church. The Spirit is what helps us to forgive each other in our church. And if we are built like bricks, there's no holes for the light to shine through. Amen. Amen. That is what living stones being built up should look like. It is messy. It is hard. It is tough. But we walk through it together. If we stuff up, apologise. If you've got an issue, bring it to the light. If you feel alone, dive into community. We get married as 20-year-olds and think we're the same person when we're 40. And so we live in pain and we live in guilt and we, we live in mess because we can't bring it to the light because we're too busy trying to chase being a brick. When that God actually calls you a living stone, you are not what you did. You are not your sin. You are not your mess. You are who God calls you to be. And God calls you to be a child of God. Amen. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures that we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together, together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That's why we are so passionate about doing stuff as community here. That's why we will fight for it. Because this is what the scriptures tell us the freedom is. This is where scriptures tell us the freedom is. And I want freedom for people more than anything. So we will fight for a culture like this. Amen? Amen. It's time as his treasured possessions to come together to create a place where we can bring our issues, to bring our hurts, and to be healed, to want to hear truth. We say that we will be truth-seeking, spirit-led, faith-filled warriors of God. Can we be that as a church? Can we be that as a church, as a community? Can we, can we do that? Because all through Scripture tells me that's where the freedom is. All through Scripture that tells me that's when the Spirit moved. The Spirit didn't move because people got an idea of how the Spirit moved. The Spirit moved because people were committed to Christ and people were committed to each other. That is where the freedom is. That is where the truth is. Amen? Amen? So when we stand and when we sing, and if you want prayer, come up and get prayer. It's not weird. Right? If you want prayer during the song, come up and get prayer during the song. Right? And we're going to sing. We're going to sing Battle Belongs. Because it's up to him. He is the one that does it. He is the one that builds a church. And all we have to do is look towards Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Amen. So I'm, I'll be like Paul and use the word, I urge you to come to community. I urge you to get plugged in, to want truth in your life, to want change in your heart, to want freedom. Amen. I'm going to pray. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your word, Father. We thank you that you are a good God with good plans for our life. We, we ask that you will come and, and your spirit will change the hearts and lives of people in this place, Father. I pray that if we have issues that are deep down, that today is a step. It's just a step in the process of bringing that issue to the light, of getting surrounded with other believers in love, Lord, and, and, and to start doing real life together and to, and, to, and to be your church. Help us to be the light. Help us to be the church. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.